Jesus, you often taught in parables. You use stories to help your listeners understand deeper truths. As we look at your parables today, give us eyes to see the truth you are showing us, ears to hear it well, and hearts that are ready and willing to respond in obedience. Thank you for giving us your words. May they leave a lasting imprint on our hearts and minds today. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew, the 13th chapter, the 24th through the 30th verses, and also the 34th through the 43rd verses. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophets. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The son of man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. Why doesn't God do something? Have you ever asked that question? Tragedies happen, horrific accidents <coughs> devastate lives and families. Tyrants and bullies force their plans on people and crush opposition, and they seem to get away with it. And sensitive souls ask again and again, why? is God apparently silent? Why doesn't he step in and stop it? The parable we have just heard doesn't exactly answer those questions, but it does speak to us about the need to wait, something we all love to do, right? <laughs> Waiting. We live in an instant gratification society. Waiting is not something we want to do. But would we really want God acting directly and immediately so that our every thought and action were weighed and instantly judged and, if necessary, punished? I don't think so. We commonly interpret the parable of the weeds and wheat as the good guys versus the evil. 
which I will speak to. But Kathy gave us a wonderful illustration of the thought. What if we are the soil and the weed in us is the bad and the wheat is the good in us? We are sinner and saint alike. Aren't we thankful for God's patience with us? So what is this waiting all about? The farmer waits for the harvest time, frustrated to see the weeds intermingled with the wheat. That could be us too, right? The Apostle Paul speaks to this. Why do I do the things I don't want to do and why don't I do the things I want to do? We skipped the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast. But in the parable of the mustard seed that grows into this large tree, the birds have to wait for the tree to grow. The woman who puts the yeast into the dough has to wait for it to work its way and for the dough to rise. Small Beginnings, a mustard seed, yeast, seemingly unimportant, everyday things with great results. And Jesus says this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Slow growth, but God is sovereign and God's will will be done. The tricky thing about kingdom of heaven living and waiting is we are living in this in-between times. Jesus came, gave instructions on kingdom living. He lived his life that way. He died because he lived that way. But he rose from the dead, defeating sin and death. We are on the other side of the cross. We are resurrected kingdom of heaven people. And yet, there is still sin. We still sin. There is death. But death does not have the final word. We live in the hope that as followers of Jesus, we, by God's Spirit, are too victorious over sin and death. So Jesus started the kingdom of heaven. We are to be living as the kingdom of heaven in the here and now, but it is not completed until he comes again. So we are in this in-between times of Jesus' resurrection and Jesus coming again. So we live as Jesus taught while we wait. N.T. Wright wrote, <laughs> Wright wrote, we who live after Calvary and Easter know that God did indeed act suddenly and dramatically at that moment when today we long for God to act, to put the world to rights, we must remind ourselves that he has already done so and that we are now awaiting, what we are now awaiting is the full outworking of those events. We wait with patience, not like people in a dark room wondering if anyone will ever come with a lighted candle, but like a people in early morning who know that the sun has arisen and are waiting now for the full brightness of midday. Waiting like people who know and trust God is in control. It's all in discipleship. We didn't read these parables either. 
The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought the pearl. It is all in discipleship. Selling all we have, giving up our selfish desires for God, for kingdom of heaven living, to serve others. In the parable of the weeds and the wheat, an enemy comes at night, and while everyone is sleeping, sows weeds. For the disciples, the enemy could have been a Judean ruler, any of those who were opponents to Jesus, threatened by the good seeds that Jesus was sowing. For the ruling class, the enemy might be Jesus himself, plundering the strong man's house. But in popular Jewish tradition, wheat or even the field itself would typically represent Israel, while the weeds would represent the nations, the Gentiles. For Jesus' first hearers, then, the parable would depict God's judgment on the Gentiles, on the weeds, and the redemption of Israel, the field of wheat. But Jesus has a way of turning things upside down, doesn't he? The field is not Israel or the church, but the world, all of us. And the primary distinction is not between Israel and the nations, but between evildoers and the righteous. Here, judgment and salvation may fall on Israel and all nations alike. But we are not the ones to judge. We also are not to separate ourselves from the world. We are to shine God's light in the world. You know, throughout the ages, there have been groups that have tried to separate themselves, to have a pure and holy, untainted way of life. No weeds allowed. The Essenes in Jesus' day were one such group. They went out to live in the desert, to separate themselves from all others. But guess what? That community was not sustainable. They died out, as do most groups who try to do that. On the other hand, there were the Pharisees who saw it as their job to pluck the evil by the root by pointing out those individuals who were obviously violating God's law and assigning them to fire and judgment. The Pharisaic approach is equally destructive because it can damage the good seed while rooting out the bad. Many, many people have been harmed by well-meaning Christians on a moral crusade who have led with judgment rather than grace. What we might see as a deplorable orientation toward evil in another person might actually be an opportunity for God's grace to grow within them and change them. If we consign them to the fire before the harvest, we do more harm than good. Jesus warns the disciples that it is only at the harvest that the truth will be revealed about each one of us. Until then, the weeds grow with the wheat, and some could go either way. It is not our job to be the Jesus police, but rather... It is our job to be faithful in our own growth, 
to share grace with our neighbors. For good or for ill, we're intertwined with them. We trust in the expertise of the master and we trust his reapers to sort it all out in the end. Jesus understood that the harvest was plentiful, but the workers who would do the right thing and follow his example were few. The wheat and the weeds grow together until harvest. In the meantime, we maintain the field, nurture the wheat, offer transforming grace to even the worst of the weeds. Our job is to know the God who created us and loves us and calls us to this all-in discipleship, being the hands and feet of Jesus in our families, in our workplaces, in our communities, in the world. We are asked to live alongside people who are not of like mind. We are not asked to change them, to take them down, or even to have them taken down. Our job is to grow. And an interesting thing happens when we make space to grow. Others grow alongside us, too. I would like to be a total new creation now. But that's not quite who I am a sinner and a saint. But we have the promise of the future that that which keeps me from God will be burned up. And there is the promise that he who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it. Amen. Friends, as we pray our prayers of the people. I invite you to respond throughout the prayer. When you hear God of wisdom, you may respond, hear our prayer. God of wisdom, hear our prayer. All-knowing God, we live among those whose lives, beliefs, and choices differ from ours. Show us how we can be enriched rather than threatened by those whom we perceive as different. And help us realize how our own ways might in fact seem strange to others. Shine your light on our common humanity for the building up and growing of all. God of wisdom, the ways of nature are still largely a mystery to us, O oh Lord. Wheat grows in the midst of weeds and tiny seeds become huge plants. Keep us in awe of the miracles around us that we might be moved to fiercely protect the creation which you have entrusted to us. God of wisdom, a small measure of yeast leavens a whole loaf of bread. So make us the catalyst for change and growth in this world. Show us the power of our words, the consequences of our actions, and the sheer strength of our love. God of wisdom. Our hearts long for you, loving Savior. Although we cannot always feel your presence, surround us with your compassion and heal our ills as we reach out to others in need. We pray today for those with particular challenges, those we name in our hearts and out loud at this time. God of wisdom, 
Blessed are the saints, O Lord, who treasured you and your kingdom above any earthly pleasure. Teach us to follow in their ways that we might come at last to the eternal joy they know in your presence. God of wisdom, gather our prayers into your arms, gracious God, and assure us of your every blessing. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Friends, we have an affirmation.